Okay, hello and welcome everyone to this session on <coughs> Asia's geoeconomics and the political risks associated with it. Uh, I can see that all of you have made the effort of staying until 5 p.m., so thanks for that. Um, it's always nice to see uh, new faces in the audience. Today I have with me a distinguished panel of people with diverse sets of experiences and perspectives who uh, will hopefully generate a lot of enthusiasm and engagement with uh, their different experiences within the region. And I'm going to begin with uh, Curtis Chin, who is uh, uh, the person on my right. He's uh, the Asia Fellow at the Milken Institute and uh, the former American Ambassador to the Asian Development Bank. Uh, to his right is uh, Karen Brooks, uh, who's the Adjunct Senior Fellow for Asia at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. She's also a longtime senior advisor to private equity firm uh, TPG uh, Capital. And uh, to my left is Evan Medeiros. He's uh, the managing director and the practice head for Asia Pacific at the Eurasia Group, uh, and he's based out of DC. To his left is uh, Yasu Hide Nakayama, excuse me. Uh, who's a member of the House of Representatives in Japan, and he's also the former State Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, in Japan. To his left is uh, Ambassador Michael Mihalik, who's the Senior Vice President and the Regional Managing Director for the U.S. ASEAN Business Council. He's also the former American Ambassador to Vietnam. So clearly we've got uh, quite a lot of inputs and insights coming from all these people sitting here. Uh, when we're talking about Asia's geopolitical context, it's quite a broad topic, and I think the best way of distilling everyone's wisdom in such a short amount of time uh, would be to define what those political risks are each of you, for each of you. Um, Asia is in a flux, there's no doubt about it. Just in the last few weeks, we've seen uh, enormous changes happening in this region. Uh, with the Rohingya crisis in Myanmar worsening, uh, the exodus of uh, tens of thousands of people into the uh, neighboring state, the neighboring country of Bangladesh. Uh, we've also seen North Korea testing its intercontinental ballistic missile and inching that much closer towards nuclear weapon capability, and perhaps more worryingly also uh, flying them over countries like Japan. At the same time, we've also seen uh, developments coming in from China, from the One Brick, uh, the Belt and the Road Initiative, where uh, China is also expanding its political reach through economic means. Uh, so quite a few topics to cover. So the balance of power is now shifting, and perhaps, Evan, we can start with you on this one. What's your take on the current situation when it comes to specifically about China uh, asserting itself in the midst of this mixed rhetoric that we're seeing from the U.S. administration, the current one. Th thank you, Preeni. It's um, a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the Milken Institute uh, for inviting me. When I think about the balance of power in Asia, I think it's important to keep in mind that Asia's role in global order is fundamentally changing. During the Cold War, Asia was largely a price taker. In other words, the security and economic dynamics in Asia were largely reflective of the broader global dynamics within the Cold War. Whereas now, the security and the economic dynamics in Asia are going to constitute and really drive broader global dynamics. Now, the U.S.-China relationship is the most obvious manifestation of that, but, but it's more than that. It's, uh, it's China-Japan relations. Um, it is the degree to which economic interdependence in Asia will either accentuate or ameliorate security competition in the region. And when it comes to China, while it's commonly argued and it's accurate to say that the size of the Chinese economy generates uh, political influence for China, I think it's an insufficient statement to just assume that China's influence is going to exponentially grow in the Asia Pacific. That's part of the story, but it's not the entire story. And what I mean by that is that too often, both sides of the balance sheet in terms of Chinese influence are not properly assessed. Because sure, China is a huge economy, the economy is growing, its linkages with other countries in the region are growing, but at the same time, 
as the Chinese economy rebalances from investment in exports to consumption and services, that's going to fundamentally change its trade relations with countries on its periphery. In particular, there are big losers. Commodity exporters throughout the region are no longer going to be able to benefit as much as they did in the past. As China onshores some of its manufacturing, countries like Thailand and Malaysia that have been part of supply chains, whether it's auto parts or electronics, are no longer going to benefit from those activities. Uh, as the Chinese government thinks about deploying economic coercion against countries like, whether it's the Philippines or Taiwan or most recently South Korea, as the Chinese begin to use those economic linkages to serve diplomatic purposes, that's going to affect its political relationships with countries in the region. At the same time as Xi Jinping um, begins to deploy the PLA much more actively, well beyond the first island chain to the second island chain, as China uh, takes a much more active role in regional diplomacy, the South China Sea and land reclamation is probably the most obvious example, as China tries to revise some of the rules of the regional economic order through AIIB and the One Belt, One Road initiative. In other words, countries in the region have plenty of reasons to be concerned about the rise of China. So this notion that sort of Chinese influence is China will come to dominate the region, I think is, I, I don't think the story is over yet. And it's important to look at both sides of the balance sheet because as China rises, its economic presence, its security behavior is also gonna alter the calculations of countries in the region to make them concerned and look for alternatives and look for uh, look to diversify their security partners and trading partners. That's a good point that you're making about uh, China using its economic clout and then using that to influence its uh, foreign policy. We've seen that in places like Sri Lanka. And of course, the African continent is the example to talk about how uh, you know, that aid with strings attached has been used quite a bit. Um, perhaps, Curtis, you know, there's no doubt that we can say that the South China Sea dispute uh, is going to dominate uh, the agenda here in Asia when it comes to geopolitical uh, risks. But we're also seeing the American administration, the current one, the rhetoric coming out of it and how President Trump is trying to uh, clean up his own camp and manage his own camp. So do you see uh, America's influence perhaps declining in the face of everything that's going on? Uh, first, uh, let me uh, follow up on a point you uh, you had discussed earlier in terms of the uh, rise of China. You know, I, I think absolutely accurate that, you know, it's, what do we say, there's a, a response and a counter response. And as China gets stronger in a way, it will also get weaker uh, because people will come together in a way against uh, China. You know, when I sat on the board of the Asian Development Bank, one of the most controversial actions that China took, this was like seven years ago, was they blocked the India uh, borrowing plan over a dispute over a territory between uh, China uh, and India. And we saw it again this year over a peace, uh, which is I think part of Bhutan, to be quite frank, that uh, China and India uh, fought over. And so for me, when I think about geopolitics uh, for our region, we've talked, and I think uh, Ian Bremmer has been great in talk about maybe we've moved to a, a G0 world, where in the old days, and we talked about the G20, the G10, the G8, uh, and then was it the G2, which was gonna be China uh, and the US. Um, but now no one's in charge and look how the world is unfolding. And so I look at it more in terms of Asia Pacific where we also I believe are going to move to a multipolar Asia Pacific versus the story that many people have that China will dominate Asia Pacific. That we will see India rise, you know, ASEAN is still trying to come together as a region and figure out what does it mean, the AEC, the ASEAN Economic Community, uh, beyond a rough uh, kind of collection of countries. And so in this changing Asia, we are indeed seeing uh, an administration that I think even have to say eight months later, seven months later, is really still finding its way forward. You know, uh, when I served uh, both under President Obama, before that under uh, President uh, Bush, I knew who I was dealing with in my own government. I had an assistant secretary for South Asia. I had an assistant secretary for East Asia and the Pacific. These jobs are not filled at the moment. And so when I think about uh, uh, your question about uh, President Trump's policies, um, I think the reality, there's still information. But um, how far will he actually go uh, to back up the rhetoric that he's um, 
complaining about back home? Well, certainly uh, probably a question best for President Trump, but I think he's already backed up some of that rhetoric with having already what we call freedom of navigation uh, kind of ship journeys through the South China Sea. In a way, I don't say you use the word like aggressive or assertive, but he's done things that the prior administration didn't necessarily do. Uh, he sent things through without a whole lot of advance notice. But then on the other hand, you've seen things where they may be taking a step back. So again, I think it's uh, in a point that's in evolution. But I think also Karen, not to jump on Karen, also had some insights uh, that I think uh, would be interested in hearing about. Uh, your take also on the administration and President Trump with regards to Asia and the Pacific region. <laughs> okay, let's do we that. We discussed this Game earlier. Game on, let's do that. Um, Prerna, thank you for having me. And uh, a, a first, a disclosure, I, I come to you not only from the United States and thus am a bit jet lagged, I'm gonna try and be coherent, but I come to you from the great state of Florida. So it's been a long week, and in that regard, I'm hoping we're gonna talk a little bit about climate change um, at some point in the panel. But to pick up on where my good friend Curtis left off, I mean, I, I guess if I were asked to give one word to global trends or, or even just talking about the Asia Pacific, I'd say uncertainty. So I had the pleasure and privilege, along with many of my friends up here, of working for several administrations. I worked for both President Clinton and for President Bush. My last uh, position being as Director for Asian Affairs at the National Security Council staff. And many people ask me, um, both then and now, how could you have worked for President Clinton and then President Bush? It was such a dramatic transition. The Supreme Court decided our election. There was so much animosity between the two teams. As a political appointee in both administrations, how did that happen? Well, and the answer is that traditionally there's more that keeps us together on foreign policy than that separates us. I mean, the, the differences on most Asia policy between one administration and the next, one party and the next, has actually been quite small. Um, that is no longer the case with what we're dealing with now in the Trump administration. And so, I mean, there's just been so much discontinuity uh, in just a short nine month period of time that you know, it makes one's head sort of spin around like the poltergeist. We have the abandonment of TPP, of course, well known. We have the treatment of allies, which continues to confuse and bemuse on any given day, both in terms of phone calls. We know that the president started his relationship with Australia in, in a very vexing way. Um, but even more recently in tweets, right, where he's sort of berating the South Koreans in the midst of this historic and very tense crisis. We have the schizophrenia regarding China, um, Evan being better place to discuss this in detail, but we've all seen how one day he's about to declare them a currency manipulator, the next they are sharing the most delicious chocolate cake <laughs> in the history of the world at Mar-a-Lago. One minute, you know, applauding Xi Jinping for being, a, you know, a champion and helping us on North Korea, and the next threatening sanctions of the banks. I mean, you really don't know what you're gonna find when you wake up on any given Day. We have the end of the era of strategic patience vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. And I, I mean, I've worked for two US presidents. I wasn't in charge of North Korea policy. I sat in many a meeting on North Korea. I have no idea what that means, the end of the era of strategic patience. And I assure you that really no one else does either. Um, we have the embrace of people that sort of really were on the outs with us kind of yesterday witness Najib being given the red carpet at the White House, re really confusing a, a lot of people. Um, again, in the spirit that US policy generally has more continuity than discontinuity when it comes to foreign affairs, generally speaking, we like to host you know, our allies, our friends, the people who are really going out of their, their way for us first, and there's sort of an order in, in which things unfold. I, I mean, Najib being there before Singapore, before treaty allies, it's all very confusing. Um, and it's not just Asia, of course. I mean, witness the president spending his social time with Putin at the G20 instead of with our traditional partners. Witness the tense relationship with the Europeans. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. NATO is obsolete or it's not obsolete. We're not really sure. The US-Mexico relationship is in the toilet. You know, we're trying not to go to war with Canada over soft lumber. I mean, <laughs> all of this, I mean, it's funny and yet it, it isn't because all of this represents significant discontinuity. And you know, the. It, do you remember that I Love Lucy scene where they're, um, very famous one, where they're at the chocolate factory? Yeah. Remember this one? And the chocolates, they start off coming slowly, and then they're just coming and coming and coming, and she and Ethel don't know what to do, and they're putting them in her hat, and they're <laughs> eating them, and they, you know. It, this is what it's like being a foreign policy observer. It's like there's almost too many things. You can't even process it all. So I would say, you know, 
I obviously have left government a long time ago, but I'm, I'm proud and happy to retain those relationships around the region. And in the capacity of my work with TPG Capital and with the Council on Foreign Relations, I'm traveling among the Southeast Asian nations once every five weeks or so and have a fairly good sense of what's happening in capitals. And I can say that it's best, best described as confusion. Mm. So Some days it's bemusement, uh, <laughs> but most days it's confusion. And confusion that, um, you know, especially for strategic thinkers in the region, like our host here in Singapore, where they do genuinely think in longer term intervals, they, they don't really know what it means. You know, how meaningful will this be? Is this a four year blip and we can kind of get back to normalcy? Or are we seeing the disappearance of the United States in a sane, rational um, role? Even if it's not a leadership role, even just a sane and rational role. So I would say it's, it's um, a lack of continuity that, that, that troubles me the most. So here's a question then, a counter one, and that would be, will this lack of continuity reflect in uh, the books as well? You know, are there uh, countries that are now wary of investing, um, especially from the United States into Southeast Asia, especially since you know the region quite well uh, during your travel. So what are those challenges that you're sort of seeing on the ground, given all this rhetoric? For investors? I just want to make sure I understood your That's question. That's right, for investors. Well, I mean, actually sort of counter logically, <laughs> you know, all the uncertainty that I just described is about us, the United States, and, and what we're doing and projecting in the, in the world and the sort of unintended and unpredictable consequences of what we are unleashing. I mean, as, as investors, so switching hats from the council and former government to, you know, more of a TPG perspective, I mean, we see lots of opportunity in the region, even in the midst of all of this un uncertainty. And we see economies that are very much sort of pushing forward without, you know, focusing too much, in, in, in a sense, on all of this political upheaval. And if you look at markets, I mean, m markets have increasingly delinked these political considerations. I mean, just look at the United States. I mean, we, we continue to break records on a daily basis in our stock markets. And kind of every day, those of us who see political risk everywhere just sort of imagine that the this is all going to come crumbling down. But markets are sort of like, whole, you know, the, again, a little bit of the I Love Lucy in the Chocolate Factory. There's just too much, and you can't even look at it anymore. So they're focusing more on, on economic fundamentals. And, and then I would add, Prerna, that there's so much money in the system that it really has nowhere else to go. I mean, money has to go somewhere. So it's going into our markets. It's going into emerging markets. And, and, and so there's really a bit of a delinking from this political chaos in a sense that I described from some of the economic dynamics we Karen, see on the ground. Can I come in on this? Because I think the term delinking is very important. And let me make two points. First is I completely agree with your assessment about uh, investors obviously seeing Asia as a source of growth. But I think one long-term consequence of some of the current administration strategies that we have to think through is, is there a decoupling between growth in the developed markets and emerging markets? And specifically the fact that uh, there's been, you know, modest but consistent growth in the US and the EU in the last two years that has not been reflected in an acceleration of growth in um, uh, emerging markets. In other words, the, the growth that Asia has experienced has largely been a consequence of China, not the uptick in growth in the US and the EU. So what's interesting is, you know, economists of the region have begun debating about whether or not the US economy is gradually over time going to become decoupled from Asia because the uptick in growth in the US has not been a principal driver of regional growth. Regional growth is a combination of credit-driven investment and consumption, autonomous domestic demand, and then of course demand from China. Right. So I think it's important to sort of keep that, that factor in mind. But to, to get to your question about the immediate consequences of Trump, I think w one real concern is with the withdrawal on TPP, uh, there's a huge question about whether or not TPP will go forward. I applaud uh, the effort by Prime Minister Abe of Japan to sort of drive the TPP-11 initiative. I really hope it goes forward because the most critical part of TPP is not the trade liberalization dimension of it. I mean, mm -hmm. when I was working for President Obama at the National Security Council, there was no higher priority or there are few higher priorities in our political relationships with other countries than uh, getting TPP done. Right. And at the NSC, we were working in lockstep with Mike Froman at USTR uh, to make sure that TPP got raised in all of Obama's meetings. 
But the key part of TPP is not just tariff liberalization. It was, it was the sort of encouragement of structural reform, structural reforms that were going to allow economies uh, like Malaysia to avoid the middle income trap. Uh, encourage Vietnam to make critical structural changes in order for that country to grow. And if TPP 11 doesn't go forward, I think that that creates huge headwinds to the medium and long-term trajectory of countries in the region who can't continue to rely on external demand from China and then credit-driven uh, consumption and investment in their own economies. So would uh, yeah, wait China, wait. yeah. I'd like to <laughs> go for, I was too, about to ask you about I think yeah. that's absolutely correct. I think that the, uh, the, the important thing about TPP is not so much the, the, uh, the tariff part of it. It is the non-tariff part of it. And the thing that I find to be very good around the region right now is that TPP is still, is still the benchmark. It is still the, the, gold, the gold standard that everybody aspires to, even though they, they know in many cases that they can't reach it. But the TPP 11 is uh, increasingly showing that, that it does have legs. And uh, we just had, uh, we just had a, the, the recent meeting of the, the ASEAN economic ministers, and much of the discussion there was RCEP, the Regional uh, Cooperative Economic Partnership, which is, well, let's just say it's very, very slow. Chances are it's not going to, uh, there'll be some kind of an agreement uh, at the end of this year, but it's, uh, it's not going to be anything that's going to be uh, very effective. But TPP 11, on the other hand, there actually seems to be uh, some b momentum behind it, and people think that it could actually happen at APEC this year. So, I mean, there's a, there's a great deal of, of uh, uh, momentum behind it. Now, the United States is not going to be in it. I mean, I think at least at this point, it's fair to say that even suggesting to this administration that, you know, someday you may want to be back in this thing is actually kind of counterproductive from what I understand. <laughs> but uh, I think that Having said that, you'll remember that during the first, first year of the first administration, the Obama uh, presidency, we didn't start anything new at all. So there were four years there where we were trying to clean up you know, the chorus and get the, the, the other Latin, Latin American uh, agreements finished. And then the second administration, we started out with, uh, with the TPP and pushed that, all the way, uh, pushed that all the way through. So, I mean, if we don't do anything, if the United States doesn't do anything on TPP for the first couple of years, of this administration, uh, you know, that does not mean that it's never going to happen. And I think that should the TPP-11 come forward, then what you're, going to, what you're going to see is you're going to see some realignment of terms of trade, particularly you know, within the, the, the T among the TPP-11, and where is that going to leave American companies? American companies who are going to be searching for trade liberalization no matter where they can find it, you know, they will try to, to uh, look at it's going to be a new factor in their investment decisions. Is this country a TPP-11 country? Can I use this to get into certain markets in Japan that now, since we're not in TPP, we're not going to have the, the advantage of, of some of those concessions? So I think that, yeah, the TPP-11 is going to be an extremely important uh, factor going forward. And it does, uh, it does fall back on, on uh, the United States, who was the, the, the largely the, the motivating force behind it. Uh, on behalf of Japanese Prime Minister Abe Shinzo, I vote for you and you. <laughs> uh, I also agree with uh, TPP. Everybody knows economy and uh, politics, economy and security alliance, always together, have to be together. So if Western country makes strong strengthening about uh, economic issue. That makes sense towards security issue, towards North Korea, towards Chinese PLA, those activities around us. And uh, this makes uh, us strong. And uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, TPP, why the politician uh, ignore the effort to make success TPP? Because they, each politician has uh, uh, problems in their politics, inside of their country, always consumer side, supplier side, which you get the vote from. This is the issue. It's a very small, uh, no good, just politicians, you know, profit. 
just for both. Look around, look the world. Has to be strong against a uh, terrorist country like uh, North Korea. Yeah. Talking about that, uh, uh, Nakayama, I mean, of course, you know, the obvious question to be directed at you right now is North Korea. Um, and would, would the recent events of uh, this intercontinental ballistic missile which is being flown over your country, is that disturbing Prime Minister Abe? And how is he going to counter this rhetoric uh, with action, perhaps? And how will that impact uh, the Japanese economy? Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, pray and I'd like to send the condolences. Uh, three days ago, uh, the New York has a big tragedy and uh, we lost lots of lives. So I pray for the soul of the victims at first. And uh, one thing I'd like to tell you, Kim Jong-un learned lots from history, I think especially from Japanese history. During the World War II, I think if I'm American, look Japan, they are like North Korea now. They are isolated. Kim Jong-un, maybe he think he would like to be, act like a Japanese emperor, former emperor. And now at that time, United Nations tried to make a sanction to stop export oil towards Japan. It's a revival in 21st century now. So China hates to do that. Of course, Russia. But Russia, they are doing shadow exporting towards North Korea more. And uh, also the 90% of the oil exporting, uh, I mean, the exporting to the North Korea is from China. And uh, if Kim Jong-un said, I will destroy Japan, and uh, we will uh, bomb you, like uh, using atomic bombs. It's effect to the Japanese feel, because we had that twice, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So we had the uh, experience already. So if even he said so, we really scary, of course. But if he makes a word, we become stronger and stronger, because we are going to use our taxpayers' money to buy uh, missiles from the United States, F-35, A and B from the United States, and uh, every single hour calling from Japanese Prime Minister to the United States President, make strong ties. Normally, we arguing with the Koreans, South Koreans, but this time, towards I the North Korean issue, we, make a, we can make a strong ties, including Taiwan including ASEAN 10 countries. We really, how, how do you say, to, to, together and uh, uh, you know, use fresh chat and also the dialogue and also action for action. And uh, it's difficult to communicate with North Koreans, of course. But uh, sometime during the campaign, US President, President said, Trump son said, he is going to, preparing for the talk by Rachel. I don't know if it's a secretly or uh, not, but uh, that is also uh, one of the, the possibility. If he and he talks, what's going to happen next? I'd like to see the new phase. Perna, uh, it seems like on this panel, I'll be the, usually Karen is the really optimistic one. I'm more optimistic uh, 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 about what is happening in the United States. Um, and I just want to say that uh, uh, one thing I take away always from Nakayama Saad is that as terrible as things were during World War II, the U.S. and the Japanese are such great friends. Uh, and so as I think of the long term, I'm hopeful for the U.S.-China relationship, the relationship between the United States uh, and Asia. I think when we think about the TPP, I remember uh, uh, Wilbur Ross, our Secretary of Commerce, said something recently to me, which was that people seem to forget uh, that there was not the will to bring the TPP uh, to Congress and to push it through and get it passed. And even if President Trump has withdrawn the U.S., let us hope that the good things that were negotiated uh, can somehow be used to motivate things and move things forward. Um, and so even when I think about all the issues being raised at this Milken Institute uh, Asia Summit, I, I do want to be hopeful. And one thing that I was pleased at was that uh, um, on the issue of climate change, a lot of disagreements, you know, uh, 
uh, sometimes in these rooms uh, on the issue of climate change. But you know, uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, former Vice President Al Gore speak at this event. And he was asked about President Trump's decision with regards to the uh, Paris, Big Paris Climate Agreement. And he said, at the end of the day, maybe it doesn't matter. Things will move forward, governors, mayors, businesses will make the decision if it's good for their business because of the reactions from consumers and others that they you know, need to improve their emissions, other things, that's what they will do. And so Vice President Gore said the reality might be that the US will meet its climate change commitments without a formal imposition on uh, uh, companies and business. And maybe that's the way things should happen. So even we talk about all the things that might happen or might not happen, my position always remains that business will lead the way. And this president has very much, just big picture, uh, United States president, is about helping American business. That's very a optimistic, strong, good. It's really I'm, optimistic. I think a stronger, uh, we talk about make America great again, uh, but a stronger America need not mean a weaker Asia. And I think too often we look at this as plus or minus, you know, negative or positive, um, and that's certainly not my viewpoint. For anyone watching this, you know, later on, uh, um, uh, Nakia was referencing the anniversary of 9-11. I don't want people to think something terrible happened three days ago. Uh, and it was a very uh, moving ceremony, those that saw it. And of course, the Japanese lost many lives also in that terrible tragedy. Sure. I'd like to get back to the North Korea question and perhaps bring Evan in into this one. Um, Evan, do you think North Korea has become a so point for China, uh, just with the recent developments that have been taking place in the last few weeks, that it's almost become a sort of burden for China to uh, rally on with its ally? It's absolutely unquestionable that North Korea is a strategic burden for China. I mean, when I was at the White House, I probably spent more time on North Korea than any other issue a as senior director at the NSC. And what was interesting is to see the evolution in China's perspective. When Obama would meet with Hu Jintao, Hu Jintao basically said, don't isolate them, try and talk with them, you know, we, China, want to do everything possible to promote dialogue. Basically, China played the role of neutral arbiter or defense attorney for North Korea. It was an incredible source of frustration for the United States. Um, but under Xi Jinping, things started to change. Xi Jinping um, was much more willing to accept risk and accept friction in the China-North Korea relationship. And that was useful up to a point, but what we found is that um, there were real structural limits to how much pressure, uh, economic pressure, diplomatic isolation, China was willing to put on North Korea, even for a leader like uh, Xi Jinping, who was willing to try and do some things. So the US strategy of trying to use pressure in order to incentivize diplomacy, we thought was going to have more success under Xi, but what we found is Xi Jinping, and I think that's, that was true under the Obama administration, and it's true under the Trump administration, Xi Jinping is not interested in putting so much pressure on North Korea that it uh, faces the choice between survival and giving up its nuclear program. The Chinese will put some pressure on North Korea, but they're not gonna sort of try and find where that magic line is that would bring Kim Jong-un to, to a strategic epiphany. And so as a result, what we're all finding out is that as frustrated as China is with North Korea developing an ICBM capability, uh, developing and testing uh, thermonuclear weapons, that uh, there are limits to how much pressure China is going to put on North Korea. And so in essence, it looks as if, as frustrated as China is, it, it, it's sort of willing to tolerate North Korean behavior right now because the alternative of collapse of North Korea, war chaos on the Korean Peninsula is simply unacceptable to China. And so basically, China's facing two very difficult choices, and as a result, it's not choosing and it's sort of uh, creating an environment where North Korea can continue to push the boundaries and continue to develop nuclear weapons uh, and missiles. So I only see the situation uh, 
getting much worse. And that you know, the unfortunate aspect is China will be the big loser in all of this. Um, in large part because it's only going to mean um, greater development of defense capabilities in Japan, in South Korea, greater U.S. military presence uh, forward deployed in Northeast Asia, stronger alliances with Japan, stronger alliances with South Korea, all of which makes China feel incredibly uncomfortable, as we saw in China's reaction to the Asia-Pacific pivot. Um, but yet, China doesn't seem to be willing to make the really hard choices that would alter the current dynamic with North Korea. Coming back to perhaps uh, the trade issues and the reason why we're debating all this, and Karen, maybe you could uh, chip in on this one. Uh, the withdrawal of the US from the TPP, of course, the TPP 11, Mike, as you said, it quite optimistic, very promising. Uh, but the initial signal that is given out by the Trump administration about the TPP itself, uh, would that affect business in this region vis-a-vis -vis the United States? And in turn, would that perhaps as a corollary uh, lift up China in its uh, influence? Ah, thanks. So first, I guess it, it's important to remember that not everyone feels the same way about TPP. And, and I was reminded of this when I was on a panel a couple of months ago with two very good friends, one from the Philippines and one from Indonesia both former finance ministers. <coughs> and I started my remarks sort of lamenting this decision on the part of the Trump administration and that it would have all these unintended consequences and that it's you know, both a disappointment diplomatically and strategically and that we spent all these years and we've undermined trust with our partners who put all this energy, I mean, the, the amount of work that goes into negotiating these agreements, as Curtis and, and Evan and Mike know very well, I mean, is extraordinary. We passed two free trade agreements when I was in the White House with. Korea and Singapore, and it's just endless, endless, endless amounts of work. And so years went into the TPP. So I was giving this sort of whole lament. And to my surprise, and I don't know why, because I know these countries so well, both of them sort of took the mic and said, we're kind of delighted. Because we need to remember that, of course, not everyone's in TPP, right? And so here's two of the most important economies sitting next to me, Indonesia being the largest by leaps and bounds, and the Philippines being the fastest growing. And both of them felt, you know, from their perspective as finance ministers, that TPP was very alienating, that it had divided ASEAN in, in ways that made them very uncomfortable. Some were in, some were out, and so on and so forth. So I think it's important to recognize not everyone's heartbroken about the end of, of TPP. Having said that, I mean, I think, you know, the obvious still stands that, that um, should the agreement go forward without the United States, obviously we're the loser in that, and that's unfortunate, we being the United States in, in, in that sense. Um, but like Mike and, and, and others, and Curtis in particular, who have this sort of optimism that even without Big Brother at the table, you know, others will pick up the mantle and, and move forward, it is still a fundamentally good thing if that agreement can move forward even without us. Uh, not so much because of the free flow of goods, but because of the structural reforms, as has, has already been said. And RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which represents the 10 countries of ASEAN and their six, what is it, dialogue partners or, no, six partners with whom they have free trade agreements, is that right? Australia, New Zealand, work with me, people. No, it's ASEAN plus six. Actually. It's ASEAN plus six, don't make me name. I, I'm jet lagged and, <coughs> and hurricane battered, so you just doing stay with yeah. me, stay with me. So RCEP, which is broader in, in that it's 16 uh, countries, um, doesn't have that structural reform component. So while it would promote at some level the free flow of goods, although really kind of de minimis insofar as each of these countries already has free trade agreements with the other, again, low bar agreements, um, it would not take the place of what TPP was trying to do. TPP was the most ambitious effort at a regional, global free trade agreement that's ever been undertaken. But you know, when you think about this, when you think about the fact that now the U.S. has, has uh, left the TPP, and a lot of people think that this was going to be uh, the, the end of, of uh, the American century, or whatever you want to call it, and the rise of China, uh, if you look at the way that China has not stepped up to the plate, I think that it's pretty instructive. I mean, I agree with with uh, with Evan completely on the on the North Korea thing being a big, uh, huge millstone around the neck of China. But the TPP also shows that China is not ready to step up and to be a leader on the in the economic rule setting uh, game. And I think what has actually shown up here is that Abe has really come up as uh, as a much stronger player than anyone would have thought. His, his uh, recent diplomacy is traveling around the world, 
uh, going around and meeting uh, allies, making friends all over the place. His, uh, his active use of ODA in, uh, in uh, Africa as sort of a counter to China and doing the same thing within, uh, within ASEAN as well. I mean, every year when we look at the ODA numbers, it's going to be either Japan or China that, that's going to take the number one spot, and Korea's in there as well. Uh, so I think that um, the, the TPP uh, shows that the, the rule-setting uh, behavior of the United States is still, believe it or not, it's still out there. And I think that a lot of things that are, that are happening economically are happening in spite of the current administration. And it is, uh, to come back to what the one thing that Curtis said, it is business that's taking the lead. I mean, business is not taking seriously a lot of the things that are coming out of the administration and instead are trying to, to say, you know, focus on tax reform. If you're going to do something, let's get a tax reform. If you're going to do something, let's get some infrastructure spending. And if those things fail, then, you know, his, his, the administration has failed. But the, the leadership of the United States in terms of, of setting the rules, I think, is still out there in, in the TPP. And the number of times, I'm, I'm sure that Asia, that Philippines and, and uh, uh, Indonesia said, yeah, you know, we're not, we're not too afraid of this. I mean, we're glad that it happened, is because they were afraid of it. They were afraid that they're going to have to start doing the same kinds of reforms that all of that the other TPP countries have made. Uh, Malaysia to this day still tells me as recently as just before uh, they, they left for Washington to, to meet with the president that, yeah, we're going to implement all of the TPP reforms that we agreed to. And they said those laws are actually written. They're actually sitting in the parliament. The parliament is sort of going slow now because we, we, got, we, we uh, left TPP and we were sort of the engine pushing everybody to get this stuff done now. And it's, they continue to tell me that it is going to happen, it's just taking a little bit longer to get it through the parliament than they originally thought. So once again, I think the U.S. Uh, uh, in terms of, of setting, the, setting the rules and in terms of having a, a great deal of say uh, in the global trade is I think we're still there. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the trade blocks of ASEAN itself. They're celebrating 50 years. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, we've got all these things going on in the neighborhood. You've got the South China Sea dispute, uh, which makes China into dispute with a number of its um, neighbors. You've also got uh, the threat of ISIL uh, in the neighborhood, um, especially when we think about Malaysia, Indonesia, as well as the Philippines, and insurgencies in various other parts of uh, you know, countries. Uh, like the southern Philippines, for instance. So perhaps this question is for everyone on the panel. Do you think that economic gains would be enough to hold uh, ASEAN together uh, as a bloc? And if so, what are those shining lights of opportunities that you see within this discourse of uh, political risks that are going on? Anyone can take this. For me, first, uh, a shout out also for, uh, I think it's uh, the 40th anniversary of U.S.-ASEAN uh, relations, uh, in addition to the 15th anniversary of ASEAN. Um, at some point, my hope is that ASEAN will expand and include Timor-Leste, maybe in PNG. But when I think about ASEAN, it will continue, and part of its success is that it's kind of roughly grouped. They don't have all those significant commitments like, say, Europe uh, pursued. Um, and that way they are staying together. But when I thought about the original title uh, of this panel about geopolitics, um, ultimately, uh, uh, the pair for who, I don't know who has it said, it's like you know, someone said that politics is ultimately local. Uh, for me, when I think about geopolitics and what's driving what's happening, China's behavior, J Japan's behavior, it's really domestic economics and domestic politics drive so much in the interaction between these countries. You know, China with its uh, big uh, party congress things happening later this year, uh, uh, Xi Jinping needs stability, all right? He wants to ensure that economy uh, uh, grows, that he can, uh, even if it's not a democracy, that he can provide to his own people. In, more, in places that are much more democratic, where you actually have to face uh, the ballot box, I again think back to what happened uh, in the US uh, this last year with regards to TPP, all these other things, I think we have to recognize that not all people are doing well in the United States. 
Uh, and so when they have a chance to vote, they're gonna vote uh, for something that they think might make things better. And I think we're also gonna see that, and we already are seeing that, uh, in the democracies, uh, and even non-democracies of ASEAN and of Asia. We have an incredibly nationalistic uh, leader of India, but for me, nationalism isn't a bad thing if you can use it to unite your country and bring things uh, forward. But we're seeing the rise of leaders that are saying to their own people, they're gonna address these things that the last leader, who might say everything is wonderful, you yourself in your heart know in your village or wherever, things are not so wonderful, and so choose me. And so I think for ASEAN, we're seeing that across ASEAN uh, uh, right now. It's interesting here in Singapore we are. Uh, um, uh, yesterday, to Singapore's great credit, they really, I would say, selected, not elected, but they chose uh, the first uh, woman president of Singapore, uh, a Malay, uh, former speaker here. Great for her, but then you hear all these grumbling, when will we have real democracy uh, here? So there's all different gradations of this movement around the region, uh, uh, giving people the chance to speak up, and governments ultimately will address it economically. Uh, and related to that, as I think, I know it was Nakiyam San or someone said, you can't separate the defense uh, aspect of it when someone says we're gonna ensure a stronger economy because we're gonna protect our investments. You know, China now has a military base in uh, uh, Djibouti in Africa. You know, China will now do what it takes to protect its one belt, one road uh, investments for better or for worse. Kurt, can I, uh, I'd like to come in on a, a very important point you made because so much of the discussion about global politics is focused on, you know, populism, right? Trump, Brexit, et cetera. But in many ways, there's a populism in Asia. It's just a very, very different variant of populism, right? Populism essentially is a support for anti-establishment voices. But in the developed markets in the West, it's manifested in you know, protectionism as a result of economic shocks, cultural shocks because of uh, immigration and even technology. Whereas populism and support for anti-establishment views and even candidates in Asia, doesn't have that sort of protectionist, anti-globalization sentiment. Asia has profoundly benefited from globalization. So what I think is most interesting, uh, one of the most interesting political trends in Asia that I think you very nicely highlighted is the fact that as the middle class grows, as demands for uh, shift from just jobs and wages to quality of life enhancements, healthcare, education, transport, physical security, that's gonna put significant pressures on the fiscal accounts of countries uh, throughout the region. And so, you know, as the um, domestic political support for anti-establishment figures like Duterte, like Jokowi, um, you can even argue Aung San Suu Kyi, as that grows, as the middle class expands, it's going to put huge pressures on governments to expand their social welfare spending in order to meet the rising expectations and rising demands of the middle class. And I think that that's going to have a uh, very significant um, uh, impact on the, the uh, fiscal accounts of countries throughout the region and ultimately their, their macroeconomic but to Karen's point, but I think that means it's a tremendous opportunity for investors and business. Because governments ultimately yeah, are gonna yes realize no, they, they won't mean, have the money to deliver all these things. Yeah, uh, you know, and so whether it's you know public-private partnerships, all yeah, these different yeah. variants, uh, but they're that's gonna need what, to figure out how to attract right, that's outside what, investment beyond what they can get from their own people. Or use credit, or use debt, in yeah. which case you know, you'll see an expansion of debt as a percentage of GDP across the region. I mean, I think one of the underappreciated structural features of Asian economies, especially Southeast Asian economies, is the debt profile isn't great, right? I mean, household debt as a percentage of GDP in Thailand and Malaysia are high and getting higher. And so, you know, it's, it's manageable now for the central banks, largely because inflation is flat, right? But as, you know, as inflation picks up, it's going to create, I mean, very difficult political trade-offs in, in those countries. So I think it's, in other words, I agree with you, but it's, I think it's gonna be these fiscal pressures from a burgeoning middle class, rising expectations, is going to pr uh, present a mixed picture. And in a world where there's not structural reforms and uh, driven by regional agreements like TPP, 
Um, I think the, the medium-term macroeconomic future for countries in the region looks a lot more challenged than it is today, right? The external environment looks pretty good, especially as uh, trade is picked up. Um, but, you know, if, if there's an exogenous shock, I think um, countries in the region may face challenges. So the, I guess the one counter to that would be that what I would say are the two most interesting and important markets are relatively insulated from regional and exogenous shock. So let's just talk about Indonesia and the Philippines for a moment. Indonesia obviously being the largest of the collective, the Philippines being the fastest growing. So two archipelagic states which sit on different sides of the ASEAN collective. And for anyone, anyone travel between Indonesia and the Philippines with regularity? Well, I do. Do you know, like, how hard is it? It's so hard to go, it's crazy. There's one PAL flight a day, Garuda doesn't fly. I mean, it's, you'd think they're in different planets. But nonetheless, these two countries, you know, are, have a ton in common. Obviously, two of the world's largest archipelagic states, the two states with the largest populations in Southeast Asia, Indonesia with its 260 million plus, Philippines now over 100 million plus. Um, they're both strong consumption-led growth economies, strong domestic demand, and um, therefore are relatively insulated uh, compared to the others, to the kinds of shocks that Evan is descri describing, both on a regional and, and global basis. Indonesia, of, co of course, is the only near trillion dollar you know, club member. I mean, it depends on its currency on any given day where it hovers on, on that balance, but it's awfully close. And the next competitor within Southeast Asia, as you all know, is, is Thailand with only 400 billion. So it's just e exponentially larger, right, than anything else, which just gives it importance in and of itself. And the Philippines, as previously referenced, has been growing faster than any of the major ASEAN economies. It, it registered something like 6.8% growth last year. It's on track to achieve, achieve somewhere uh, around the same. So these two economies are but, enormously important. But interestingly, important. the peso is the worst performing Asian currency this year, which, which I, I absolutely agree with your assessment. Right. But it's sort of, there's some weird anomalies here. There are, and I think a little bit of that is uncertainty related to Duterte. But again, absolutely. keep in mind, the Philippines enjoys a current account surplus by virtue of its 10% of GDP growth that comes from remittances overseas, and it's 10% of GDP that comes from services. So it's, you know, compared to Indonesia, even in that respect, more insulated from, from regional and, and global dynamics. Uh, uh, just a few more points on these two economies that from an investment perspective, um, you know, TPG's got investments in both of these economies. We spend a lot of time looking at both of them and are looking forward to putting a lot more money to work in, in, in both places. These are both countries with a strong history of technocracy. Uh, if you look over successive administrations, almost without exception, of course, there's always one or two um, clunkers that you might point to, they have a tradition of putting really talented economic professionals in the most important economic posts. It hasn't always delivered the results everyone's looking for, but this does distinguish itself from a lot of, a lot of its neighbors. And currently you have two leaders, not uncontroversial, of course, in the case of the Philippines, um, that have identified infrastructure, which has been the singular vulnerabil vulnerability, or at least the standout vulnerability among many in, in their economic structures, identified infrastructure as the most important economic priority, and have been mobilizing and rallying considerable amounts of state resources to that effect, as well as going around the region and the world to drum up resources on a G2G basis. If you look at what Jokowi has done in just three years of his first five-year term, he's built more roads, ports, light rail, and so on and so forth than the 10 years of his predecessor by, by, by leaps and bounds. Duterte's a little earlier in his, in his administration, so we don't have as much of a track record to look at, but he's basically doubling resources by 2018 budget and has drummed up a lot of support from South Korea, Japan, and China for, for this effort. If either president, let alone both of them, achieves even a percentage of their stated ambitions vis-a-vis -vis infrastructure, and I would submit in the case of Indonesia that that's well underway. Who's been to Jakarta recently and st sat in mind-boggling traffic, <laughs> which is not just the normal Jakarta conundrum, but because they're building a subway and light rail and overpasses, and they're doing this all at the same time in the center of Jakarta. Um, if they achieve even a portion of their stated objectives, it will have a transformative impact on these economies. Every World Bank, ADP, ADB, IMF, you name it, report on these economies for a decade or two decades has been highlighting infrastructure as the one binding constraint on their economic growth, and they are committed, and it would seem to me well on their way in the case of Indonesia to addressing some of these critical concerns. I think that's right, except that I think Indonesia is also probably one of the most protectionist countries in ASEAN right now today. 
I mean, you've got, you've got uh, if we look at the digital economy, which is what's going to be generating all of the growth in the future, you'll find that, that uh, throughout ASEAN, one of the, one of the negatives that, that's happening in ASEAN today is that just about every country has got some kind of a law that in some manner, shape, or form is trying to control or limit what's going on on the Internet. Now, and, and Indonesia is one of the worst. I mean, if you look at their single payments gateway, which is going to cut out all foreigners from, from, using, from being able to participate in the uh, uh, electronic payment system in Indonesia, same thing is happening in Thailand. Vietnam has now got a law on the books, or not, not on the books, but is generating a law now, again, which is going to be a single payment uh, uh, gateway. Uh, if you look at the privacy laws, privacy laws are springing up again in, uh, in uh, Indonesia, in the Philippines, in Thailand, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, the, the, uh, this is adding to kind of the balkanization of the Internet rather than the uh, allowing the Internet to play uh, the, the unif unif unifying role and the, the liberating role which it can do for MSMEs, which is uh, like 90% of all of the companies within ASEAN. Now, having said all of this, having said all of this, you know, we were talking about an ASEAN single window like 15 years ago when, when they first started to look at this. This uh, September, we're actually going to see an ASEAN single window get up and running among at least five uh, economies within ASEAN. They said it couldn't be done, and <laughs> now it has been done. And I think that the whole, uh, the whole idea of ASEAN is, uh, is beginning to gather some momentum. I mean, when they uh, put together the AEC, the ASEAN Economic Community, um, it was, well, it was underwhelming is, is what it was. I mean, it's more of a journey than a destination, uh, if you will. But the, the fact remains that it is moving forward. And this year, with uh, the Philippines uh, in the lead, uh, the chair of, of ASEAN, you could sense that there was there's some excitement going on between the private sectors and the government in terms of the way that they're looking at economy, the way that they're looking at development. And next year, <coughs> with Singapore as the chair, I think you're going to see uh, even more of an acceleration of some of the structural reforms that we're talking about. Uh, many of, much of this hopefully is going to come in the digital economy and we will try and get rid of some of the, some of the protectionism that is, uh, that is out there. Uh, but to go back, but uh, uh, I think that ASEAN does have, uh, does have a future. But to go back to one thing that you were saying there, uh, uh, Curtis, about uh, all politics being local, well, it's the all politics being local that, that is, it is, is kind of dividing ASEAN. Uh, if you look at uh, the average tariff level among ASEAN nations, it's, it's below 5%. But if you look at the non-tariff barriers within ASEAN, they have rose, risen exponentially to where now there are, well, I think the OECD says there are 6,000. The WTO says there are 5,000. I mean, after 3,000, who's counting anymore? I mean, so, uh, so there, are, there are a lot of issues within ASEAN. But nevertheless, those 1,300 meetings per year that ASEAN has, <laughs> does, uh, they do bring together uh, the ASEANs, do bring together the ASEAN leaders, and there has not been a major war among the ASEAN, uh, the ASEAN 10, you know, for about 50 years now. So that is something that, unfortunately, we can't say. So I think that uh, sure. there, is, there is some hope for ASEAN. Um, uh, it's... Uh, you, you just have to embrace the water on stone philosophy. That's all you have to do. Look, now. having said that, if, I'm, if I may, in ASEAN's defense, and Evan may know that I was on occasion in the White House referred to as the customer service desk for Southeast Asia, which I don't think was meant affectionately from my colleagues in the United States, but I think, I, because I did defend ASEAN and Southeast Asia and try to give it its due whenever given the opportunity. 2016, fastest growing subregion on the planet, ASEAN, 4.8%. That may sound underwhelming to you, but the next closest was Middle East and North Africa, under 3%, 2.9x. Sub-Saharan Africa, CIS, I mean, you know, forget about it. And Latin America, contracting. So, you know, ASEAN's getting some things right, people. It, it, it bores us to tears with its bureaucracy and its snail's pace of, of certain elements of what it's doing, but it also has a lot of innate natural strengths. I mean, it's 625 million people, makes it the third largest market but, behind China. But Karen, just to and, sort of play India. this argument out, 
Do you're it. You're talking about Southeast Asia, and I absolutely agree with your assessment of Southeast Asia. So Southeast Asian economies absolutely are growth leaders, and they're doing an enormous amount of credit. ASEAN as an institution is not the driver of those growth. I mean, think, Fair think, think about the ASEAN economic community when it was done at 2015, right? I mean, has ASEAN accomplished its goal of liberalization of goods trade? Yes, more or less, at about 98, 99%. How about liberalization of trade and services? Nope. Liberalization of Movement labor of markets? <laughs> no. Nope. Yeah. Liberalization of finance? Absolutely not. So there's an enormous potential there, but I think we, we, you know, we're gonna need to look at other mechanisms, TPP being one, and, you know, look, I mean, you know, Jokowi came to the White House, he told President Obama, I'm gonna join TPP, so, you know, what happened there? So, it, my point is, is that there are going to have to be other mechanisms to encourage the next phase of liberalization and integration. Some Southeast Asian leaders who have the vision and the political capital are gonna do it. ASEAN as an institution is not gonna do it. On that very optimistic note, I think we're running completely out of time. But here's uh, just one last question to each of our panelists. What are the two biggest uh, geopolitical risks that you see? Just in two words, please. We can two start words. off with the lady. Two. Yes. Two China and North Korea. Um, three words, but I think you know. Yeah, My intention fine. was. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, 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 no, but together it'll work because I'll just say China. So that, that's four words, but China. North Korea, North Korea, North Korea. <laughs> uh, we think about the geopolitics, but uh, I worried about the cyber attacks because there are no borders, but they can attack easily. And about the economy, uh, even TPP or the other system come to the Asia. Japan, the liberal democratic country, has to lead this the economy of the Asia. That is our responsibility. Thank you. South China Sea and North Korea. Brilliant. Thank you very much to all of us on our panel here today, and thank you, audience. <laughs>